an hour for each guest. We can overrun slightly, but not too much. So um, if you have a question for Guna, stick your hand in the air. I will come to you. We've got a roving mic. So if you've got a burning question for our star, please don't be shy. Stick your hand in the air and we'll come to you. But if I can begin, um, take us back um, 40 years to where you were and what you were doing when you were given this opportunity to make this little movie that's become almost a defining moment in your life. What were you doing all those years ago? Um, I had just left graduate school and I had a job. I had been working as a bartender in a restaurant and uh, I got fired. And uh, when I got fired, I was looking for something to do for the summer. So I heard these fellows were in town making a horror movie and they were looking for someone to play the killer. And um, actually, originally, I ran into someone who told me that they, had, they, that they had already hired the killer, which was too bad because uh, he said I would have been perfect to play the part. And then about two weeks later, I ran into him again on the street and he said, oh, they, the guy that's supposed to play the killer is hold up drunk in a motel. So he gave me the name of the casting director, who was Bob Burns, who was the art director on Chainsaw. And I had a vague conversation with Bob, and he said he'd call me, which I knew enough about the movies to know it meant get lost. But uh, one day or two days later, he called me and asked me to come down and meet the director and the writer. So then I had a long meeting with Toby Hooper and, and Kim Hinkle, and was cast. Now, was it? Partly to do, to do with your height, your size. What, what was it that they wanted from you? <laughs> well, that's sort of the thing. Uh, uh, Toby explained the character pretty, you know, in his relationship with the family. And he, this is what really revealed how much Toby, or little Toby, didn't know, knew about acting. He asked me if I was violent. And I said, no, I'm not violent. And he said, well, are you crazy? And I said, not the way you mean. And then he said, he got this worried look and said, well, can you do it? And I said, oh, sure, it'd be easy to do it. And he goes, okay, you got the part. And then later, a week or two later, when we were signing our contracts, uh, we had a, what they called a contract party, where everybody met to get fitted for their costumes and figure out what they're gonna do with their hair and all of that stuff. And, we give, and we're actually given our scripts. When Toby gave me my script, or actually when I signed the contract and handed him the contract back, he said, you know, when you came for the interview, I knew I wanted to cast you. And I said, oh, why? You know, thinking there must be a great answer. And he goes, well, because you filled the door. And I realized the only reason he cast me was I was the biggest person who tried out for the part, and that he had no expectations for talent, for acting. He just wanted the biggest piece of meat who could lumber around on the set. So that's it. We've just had uh, Tom Savini doing an interview and uh, somebody asked him about how much improv he brought to one particular role and how much was in the script. Can I ask you the same thing? What was in the script that you were given and how much of Leatherface is scripted and how much of it is going to answer? Well, the script in general, uh, for instance, in the scene that uh, when, the, when Pam gets off the swing and walks to the front door, the script just says she gets off the string, gets off the swing, and walks the front door. So all of that was a decision made on the set. And likewise, the the characterization is minimal in the script for just the different people. And I essentially Toby said, Toby just left us alone. He always explained where he wanted me to stand in a shot, where he wanted me, you know, where do I start, where do I end up. But as far as any stage direction from Toby, uh, in the scene where Leatherface runs to the window, very upset, he said, uh, you're, you're wondering where these people are coming from. And then in the scene where the cook comes home and is really angry and Leatherface is running around and sort of patting stuff and squealing, all of that had, was scripted. Uh, I mean, in the sense that he has this gibberish, and then Toby told me what every line meant. And then I did it that way, and he said, ah, that, that doesn't work. There's too much intelligence in the character. Just make it so he knows that you can make noise and it means something, but he has no idea beyond that. That's the sum total of his directing of my playing the 
playing Leatherface. Uh, everything else I just made up as I went. The dance at the end, Toby said, all right, you're angry and frustrated. So I was just stomping around, and I kept thinking, this is really stupid looking. And what happened was, I couldn't see out of the mask very well, and I realized when I turned, I saw a Toby duck. So I thought, well, I, this is my one chance to scare him, because he knows I can't see him very well. So all of the dance was simply me winding up to take one big swing with the chainsaw at Toby, because it was a live chainsaw. And that's how that whole dance happened. It was just improvised on the, in, in the moment, you know, to, and in fact, there's some outtakes I recently saw that when I'm finished that swing, I just let go of the saw. So <laughs> I do that swing around, it comes across the lens of the camera, and then the, there's footage that shows me, then take the saw, just keep swinging it, and launched it out into the pucker brush, because uh, I was so tired of this movie. You know, and, then, and I knew I was done with it. I never had to pick it up again. You, uh, you, you told me many years ago that um, your first day on the set, you were very keyed up, yeah. very tense, and not, not necessarily nervous, but you were all fired up to, 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 to deliver on that performance. And you'll tell the story better than me, but you had to um, move a character and close a door. Tell us what actually happened. Okay, so it's the first time that you see Leatherface on the on the screen, and it's when uh, Kirk, uh, the first victim, is killed. And the scene is he comes in, trips, Leatherface steps into the doorway and hits him. And then he lands on the floor, and then what I was supposed to do was then just bend down and pick him up and drag him out of the doorway so I could close the door. And uh, I was so excited and charged up that and then what they did was I just to drag him around the corner so I could drop him out of the way of the camera I mean out of the way of the door and then close the door so they put pillows behind the door so I could drop him on something soft so the first thing that happened was I actually hit him in the head with the hammer now the hammer was wood with a foam mallet but it left a big bruise and in fact, the producer came running over because he thought I had just killed one of the actors. So we got that all figured out and then we do the rest of the shot and I'm like this and I picked him up and instead of just dragging him out and dropping him on the pillows, I threw him out of the doorway. So he went flying over the pillows and head first into the wall and then landed quite comfortably on the pillows, but he was semi-conscious by the time he hit the pillows. And then I slammed the door. I wasn't supposed to do that. I was supposed to just, just slide the door closed. By that point, I was so crazy with excitement. That's how I ended up slamming the door like that. And luckily, the door weighed nothing. I mean, there's no substance to it. But luckily, the way the, the, where the door slid in, that part of the woodworking there, the, the timbers, were kind of crooked, and so the door jammed, and you know it wouldn't. Uh, it would slide shut and hit and just lock up, which was really good because when you slammed the door, the door was light enough that what normally would have happened was the door would have hit and kind of bounced. But because it jammed once it went into that little slot, it looked like it weighed a ton because it just went wham and just stopped. So it looked great. But it was all just because there was a slight error in the way the door was made and constructed, and I was so keyed up that I just went berserk. You, you told me a story many years ago, which I've always remembered, and I remember the telling of it as well as the story itself. And we were halfway through an interview, and uh, Guna was telling this story, and he said, wait a second, and he paused, he said, I'm listening for the door slamming. And we were listening next to the theater where the film was playing. And you, you paused for a second and you heard the bang of the door. And he said, that's the bit that always gets the audience. Right. Rather than the hitting on the head, it's the slamming of the door. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Well, there's a stinger there. Uh, what the, you know, the, the, one of the, the biggest key to the success of this movie is the, is the sound design. And that little stinger was put in by uh, Wayne Bell, who was the sound, uh, he was the boom operator, but he also composed the score and, and did the sound effects. And so when that door slams, in the, there's this note, boom, like that. 
Well, there's also a stinger that's almost subsonic. So when they slam the door, there's, it's like the sound of doom. It's, there's not just the sound of the, the door slamming. There's this tone that goes And it extends until the next shot. So the next shot is, is Pam on the hook going, Kirk, you're still hearing subconsciously that booming sort of the sound of doom from the door slam. And I think that's why that whole scene becomes so ominous. It, just because of that little bit of sound, and it's the kind of sound that if you're paying attention, you'll notice it. But if you're just in the movie, you'll never, you don't hear it. You just, you just suddenly feel really creeped out. So that is the, the point that everybody's, you know, usually in a theater, most people have seen the movie. When Kirk gets killed, everyone cheers. And it's not because they hate Kirk, it's because they're going, now the killing begins. But when the door slams, they all fall silent because it's like, and now comes everyone's doom. And, they, and it just they puts everyone down you know, in their intensity. And then, of course, moments after that, when Pam gets put on the hook, half of them get up and leave. Well, just, just before we talk about the hook, yeah. I want you to, um, and before we come to questions, I want to just go back to the, the beginnings of the story. Um, the story is very, very loosely based on Ed Gein. What's your remembrance of Ed Gein, and how does it fit into what became Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Well, I, I knew of Ed Gein because the movie Psycho was based on Ed Gein, inspired by Ed Gein. Uh, and people think there's a lot more of Ed Gein in this movie than there is. I asked. Uh, Toby and Kim one night, we were, in the middle of the night, we're waiting for a shot to be set up, so we're all sitting just waiting, and I asked him, I asked him how did they come up with the idea for this movie, and he said, Ed Gein, he said, now, Ed Gein ins gave us the idea for the bone, the skin and bone furniture, and the mask. He said, everything else, we just wanted to stick everything that ever frightened us into one movie. So, Ed Gein really is, it's the mask, it's, it's the mask and the bone furniture, you know, and the skin lampshades and all that. But that's really all there is of Ed Gein. Now, if you watch it and think about it a lot, you, um, I, I, I did this book, Chainsaw Confidential, it came out last year or a year and a half ago. I realized when I was working on the book that if you look at the cook, he is like Ed Gein in the sense that he seems quite normal and friendly, kind of a shy guy from a distance. But the closer you get to him, the closer you look at him, the more frightening he is because the more you understand how deeply insane he is. But that's that's very, uh, that's like too smart by half to get into that in that sense that you're already over-interpreting when you start to get to that level. I don't think that had anything to do with what they were thinking. Uh, I wonder what they're burning. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, uh, so, so I don't think that was any intention. I think it's just something you can look back at and go, isn't that a curious coincidence? But I, that's really all there is of Ed Gein in the film. Um, there isn't much else. Didn't they talk about they wanted a family of Ed Geins as well? The whole, the whole family was corrupted in the same way. Well, they never said, I mean, it may be. And the thing is, when you, Toby Hooper now, it, you know, has given interviews, and it's like, his, and we all do this, we all reinterpret our experience. At the time, he just said, Ed Gein, mask, bone furniture. And then he said, that's all he ever said to me at the time. Uh, I mean, now, the last interview, I saw an interview with him where he said, I didn't even know the guy's name. You know, I just knew it was someone in Wisconsin. Well, that's curious, because I remember he said Ed Gein, because I had, and I remember thinking, oh, I know who he is. But, so I don't know about that. I mean, it is kind of a family of enemies in a way. Um, but I'm not sure how, you know, to what extent he was thinking that at the time. Um, but everybody wants it to be. And before we come to questions, um, there's another tremendous um, makeup effect or uh, shock effect in the film, which is the hanging of Terry McMinn on, on the hook. Um, and I know that you you can go into some detail as to how that was exercised and affected um, and still scares people today. 
how did it how did it happen? Well, it's interesting because you know when I was writing this book, uh, it's just a series of short pieces that are cut together. But when I was writing the book, I I wanted to really understand that scene. So I watched this little three minutes or two minutes over and over and over again, and I had a stopwatch, and I, I realized that it's, it's so efficiently done. It's three shots cut together, or maybe it's four, depending on where you want to start the counting. Leatherface walks in carrying her. He drops her because he's, he's, she's facing away from him, and we needed her back. Uh, away from Leatherface so that the hook can go in. He drops her as if she, to let her escape. I mean, as if she's going to escape. But, so she starts to run off and he grabs her again. Of course, now she's turned the right way. That's all one little take. And then what happens is there's a shot, and, and, and in that process you see the hook because there's a shot from the upper corner looking at what's going on with the hook in the foreground of the shot. You're looking down past the hook. <clears throat> So you go back to that shot of the hook as Leatherface picks her up. And you see her back approach the hook. You cut back over Leatherface's shoulder again. And he drops her on the hook. That whole little four shots takes, I don't know, six or seven seconds at the most. And you're convinced because the last thing you see before he drops her on there, you see the hook. You're absolutely convinced you see the hook go in her back, but in fact, you don't see anything. What we did was they turned the hook around so that for the last shot over my shoulder as I drop her onto the hook, the hook is actually facing, the point of the hook is facing away from her. She had a harness on uh, with a cable that came up to a ring up her back. So before we shot that, I lifted her up uh, we threaded her onto the, we threaded the ring on the cable onto the shaft of the hook. So she was already essentially threaded to, so that the hook would catch on the ring or the ring would catch on the hook. So we start rolling the camera and I've got my, her up, I've already got her raised full up. And then all I did was drop her so that uh, the ring slides down the shaft of the hook and when it gets to the bottom of the hook, it stops and it looks like, because of the way it catches her, it looks like it. It just went into her back and stopped her, but the hook is pointing away from her. So it, it was such a simple solution, but the great thing is when you look at it, it's four very quick, clean shots that convince you that you've just watched the most brutally explicit killing in movies, but you don't see anything. That's the magic of movies. Now, we have some questions.